Isopath. I love this game. It's a two-player board game, and I've already made a video about making a board like this and about how to play the game. But I would like to have a board that's a bit more impressive, so I'm going to revisit this game. This video will be dealing mostly with tiles like this one, but in order to build my new game board, I'll have to complete all three of these projects. That's right, there's three things here. I have to make pieces, I have to make marble tiles, and I'm going to use this piece of solid surface countertop to make the board itself. Let me spend a couple of seconds on how to play the game just so that you understand why I'm making the parts the way that I'm making them. One side stays down on the board itself and the other side stays up on top of two tiles like that. So when it's your move, you can move one tile and one piece and the object of the game is to get to the opponent's base. Oh, and you can also capture the opponent's pieces if you surround them on two sides. So a frequent criticism that I was receiving from the last video was that the tiles move too easily and it's frustrating to place them. And a lot of people suggested locking mechanisms, magnets, pieces with male and female ends, etc. I didn't like most of those ideas because they were either difficult to implement or they distracted from the gameplay visually. So let me show you the game board that I want to make so that it'll have the ultimate gameplay experience. Our first order of business is to make the game tiles. To do that, I'm using these pre-made mosaic sets. And conveniently, there's 42 tiles in them. Make sure if you get one that you look to see that it has six by seven rows. Six times seven is 42. We need 37 to make a game board. The tiles that I'm using are just under two inches, so one of these sets approximates a square foot. These sets come in a wide variety of shape, sizes, and colors, and they're not too expensive. Since the beginning, I had my mind set on using white marble, so this might not be as flashy as what you might be able to find, but it's what I want. And in order to get the texture that I want, I'm going to have to acid wash these. But first, before I can do that, I have to remove this backing. Wow, so it ended up being really tough stuff. And in the end, the best way to remove it was by using patience. I let I let it soak in just regular tap water overnight. And now it's coming right off. Wow! You have to be kind of careful with marble. It's not as tough as you might think if you've never worked with it before. In fact, you're going to see that in the next step. But I still have to mechanically remove some of this adhesive. By the way, I'm not going to be using these textured ones, but it's all they had available. They still need a little bit of cleanup, but it's not bad at all. And if you'll let me speculate a little bit, I don't think that the adhesive is water soluble. I think that my tap water is just slightly acidic. So it released the marble from the adhesive from underneath. Look, it came off in kind of one piece. Once I'm finished with this, we'll move on to the fun and interesting part, which we'll use muriatic, also known as hydrochloric or gastric acid. That means stomach acid. So you have to take this stuff very seriously. I don't want to lecture you, but if it can dissolve a bacon cheeseburger in a six pack, it can seriously mess up your eyes. Notice the skull and crossbones. Don't even think about having this without having baking soda on hand and lots of water. That's the trick, baking soda and water. If you get it on your hands, it will start to feel oily, like soapy. That feeling is your skin starting to dissolve. So you, will, you, you would have to quickly neutralize it. Okay, look, muriatic acid isn't 
poison per se. It just has a really low pH. How can I explain this? Once it's neutralized, it turns to salt and water. If you take lye, like oven cleaner, sodium hydroxide, and mix it with muriatic acid, both of those things are the most awful chemicals that you would ever want to come in contact with. If you mix them together, they literally become salt water, and it becomes hard, harmless. They neutralize. You can think of things that are acidic as being hydrogen ions, like H+, and things that are basic as being hydroxide ions, like OH negative and H plus plus OH negative is hydrogen hydroxide. Actually, that's not what it's called, but let's just call it that for now, and that's just water. A neutralized acid or base is not a toxin. So when we're handling this stuff, we don't want fear and avoidance. We want to be informed and cautious. So if it gets on your skin, lots of water and baking soda. Okay, let's move on. There's a lot to explain. This peanut butter jar will hold the acid. It's glued down to this base just to minimize its chance of spilling. Note that there's a vent hole, because if you put something in acid and it bubbles, it can make a bomb. <laughs> so we don't want to build up internal pressure inside here. It's just for short-term short, short -term storage anyways. This is just plain water, and there's lots of it. After I dip into my acid, I'll dip them into this to, you know, neutralize it. This will be, for a quick rinse, it will have some baking soda in it and that's in case I get it on my hands. But I will dip them in that just to make sure that the acid stops working after I'm all done. This is a one minute timer and I found that a minute is too long. The acid will eat too much of this in that amount of time. 30 seconds isn't long enough, so I'm going to be going for around 40 seconds. This is a dipping mechanism made out of copper wiring and it serves as a rack they can dip three at a time. That will speed up the process. But we don't want to do too many at a time because the bubbling will be too much for the peanut butter jar. And one last point before I get on with it. I'm keeping them all wet. And my reasoning for that is, for one, it makes it softer to knock down these sharp edges because I want them slightly rounded on just the top surfaces. But I'm also hoping that by keeping them wet, when I put them in the acid bath, it will absorb less acid on the inside of the marble because I want the acid etching to be superficial. I only want it to stay on the outside. I don't want it to weaken the internal structure of the marble. It's kind of difficult to express on video just why I'm going through all the trouble. This is a piece of polished marble. This is how they came. And this is the texture that you get after the acid wash. The best way that I can describe it is soft. It has an aged look, like marble that's been weathered by the acidity of rain. Maybe this will be easier to see if I just do one at a time. It's definitely less eventful. You get the idea. And of course you can expect marble to have some impurities. 
which may dissolve at different rates in the acid. And the sanding block will knock those down really easily. It gives it a very nice feel. A flat sharpening stone like this one is also great for tile work, especially if you keep it wet. But what I ended up using most of the, during most of the process was an old grinding wheel. If you break it apart, works great. Keep it wet. And about the sharp edges. Eventually I grew tired of using the glass file, so I started using the chamfer machine instead. Marble is soft enough to get away with it. Just to be clear, this was all done before the acid dip. My tiles are almost done. Only two easy steps remain. Waxing and felt. I'll wax them first because I don't want to stain the felt. I'm using car wax because, well, it smells lovely and I don't, it doesn't seem to be disagreeable to the touch. If you're concerned with that, you might want to use beeswax. Beeswax will also give it a nice feel. But it also will help to make the marble impervious to moisture and staining, you know, oils from your hands. I don't really know what it is. I can't explain it. But this is the step where the magic happens. There is a reason that artisans have been fixated with marble for ages. That ugly spot on the ground is spray adhesive. I, I've given up trying other ways. I just do it right on the ground. And then every so often, when it gets too bad, I'll throw some sawdust on it and then let it soak with some water on it overnight and then it comes right off in the morning. The felt that I'm using is a wool rayon blend. Most of the craft felt that you're going to find out there is that eco-friendly stuff. It's cheap and it's not as soft. For a quick comparison and how to tell the difference, Here's your standard polyester craft felt, and here's the more expensive stuff. Oh, and I also rinsed this under cold water and then hung it to dry for a while. Um, the reason to do that is to rinse off anything that might have smuggled on board during the manufacture process, and it helped to soften it a bit. I also need a temporary board just for now. Perfect. Wait a second, Pocket. You aren't addressing the sliding problem at all. Uh, okay, it could be said that I'm evading it. I just increased the mass. I just made them heavier, and then that made it no longer a problem. These pieces are just simply heavy enough that they don't slide all over the place. Simplicity. I like it that way. Still, while we're on the subject of tiles, I can show you a way to improve one of the boards that I made before using friction. Watch this one first. And now look at this one. Not bad, right? I'll show you how to do it. The trick is a thin layer of silicone. Now, there is such a thing as self-adhesive silicone sheets, but they're very expensive and not easy to find. So this is a silicone caulking. Now, uh, the first couple prototypes were tough because the silicone doesn't stick well, but I can show you how I got past that. I think I've worked out the technique enough. It seems to be working. So now I just need to do it 37 times. First, a piece of 40 grit sandpaper. That's super aggressive. Take a look at it up close. And a note on grain direction. We only want to sand the piece this way and this way. 
That means that since my plywood grain is running in this direction, I want to sand it like this and like this. That easy. On to the drill press. Okay, next step. I've prepared a piece of wax paper by lightly coating one side with spray adhesive. And this is a piece of very thin glass. Now I'm just lightly misting the surface with regular tap water. Now we give it just a little blob of silicone. And then we press it in place until it squirts out on all six sides. The silicone is now nice and set up. And now we'll apply some heat to the glass on the back side and that's why we use the wax paper. They should fall right off. If you pay attention, you'll see that the wax paper will start to liquefy and it looks dark. The clear silicone obscured the scratches from the sandpaper pretty nicely. Not bad. Those look pretty good. And they're really grabby. Is it the ideal solution to the problem? No, absolutely not. But that's what we're doing here, isn't it? We're trying to do things differently. I would encourage you to try something different too. So, does it work? These are the original pieces on this side, and I'll try not to exaggerate, but you can see what it's like. And here are the new pieces, which are a significant improvement. But to return to the main project, Wow, this board's hard to fit on camera. I have yet to finish it though. I want to make my solid surface board and I want to make my pieces, which I'm going to carve from raw materials. So I'm glad you joined me and I certainly hope that you're interested enough to return to see how this project ends up. I'm really excited about it. So come back. See ya.